Well, good morning, church family. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 this morning. As we wrap up this uh, three-part mini-series, we are the church, as you heard on the video. So I know many of you are excited because you have made it to the holidays, right? Uh, There has just been something about this year. You've been anticipating this time and just longing for it and waiting for it. And yet, even this moment feels a little different to us. We know that 2020 feels challenging to us because it feels like the rules have been changing uh, by the day uh, and sometimes by the hour. And so one of the funnier things I saw this year was a a fake pandemic press conference uh, that somebody put together several months ago. And so it had this lady dressed up like she was giving a press conference. It had all these kind of fake microphones in front of her. uh, And she began to share some of the rules like press conference style. First, you must not leave the house for any reason unless you have a reason and then you may leave the house. All stores are closed except the ones that are open. And they all must stay closed unless, of course, they need to be open. Makes a lot of sense, right? So, number two, you must not go to work unless you get another job, at which point you may go to work. So, stay home. I don't know how many more celebrities we need to have tell you how important it is to go out. Right? I mean, it's just the way this year's been. Number three, there is no shortage of items in the grocery store, but there are simply many things missing. You don't need to go buy a bunch of toilet paper, but you should buy some in case you need it. And this is probably my favorite one, right? Animals are not impacted by the virus, except that cat that tested positive in Belgium and a couple of tigers in a zoo somewhere, right? It's like, what, what are we supposed to do with this? And so we have felt so confused all year and we hoped, right, that we could get to this moment, like Thanksgiving, Christmas, things would lock in, they would be easier. I was texting back and forth with one of my buddies who's in my doctoral cohort. He's a church planter in another state. uh, And he sent me this back a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen some version uh, of this statement. So let me get this right. Six allowed at a Thanksgiving, but 30 for a funeral. So I will be holding a funeral for my pet turkey that will pass away on November 26th. (laughs) Refreshments provided, right? That's my favorite line right there. Refreshments provided. So listen, what I'm not trying to do here, obviously, is mock our officials. They have a hard job to do. Believe me, I know that being a leader. But the reality is, is we have to laugh at ourselves a little bit with everything that's going on right now in our world. And here's what I take a lot of comfort in. In a year that feels very apocalyptic to so many of us, it is comforting to know that Christians from the very beginning have faced seasons of uncertainty and confusion as well. As a matter of fact, the whole context of this passage that we're going to read today, the letter to the church of Thessalonica, the second one, was written in the context of first century believers who were afraid that they had missed the second coming. You talk about FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Like they were seriously afraid that they had missed the second coming of Jesus. And so Paul writes to them to say, don't be afraid right? Don't be deceived. Remember what I taught you. If you belong to the Lord Jesus, then you are in his hands and he is working out all things. So what's our job then? Paul's going to remind us. Our job is to give thanks, to give thanks for what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and being strengthened in that knowledge to continue to do every word and good work in the name of the gospel. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word this morning as we read 2 Thessalonians 3, I'm sorry, 2, verses 13 through 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace encourage your hearts and strengthen you 
in every good work and word. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, I pray today that we see gratitude for what you have done for us is not something we're supposed to just celebrate a week or a day, a year, but instead it's part of our posture. It's part of our lifestyle as disciples of Jesus. So God, I pray that in a time of uncertainty and confusion, this would strengthen us for every good word and work as well. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. So as we've been talking about in this series, we don't go to church. We are the church. Say it one more time with me. We don't go to church. We are the church. And that's such a healthy reminder for us in this moment. It's what's happening in this time of uncertainty and confusion. It hasn't caught anybody off guard or by surprise. And so the reality is, is that we know that God knows exactly what he's doing in this moment. And he knows what he's doing in and through us. And so one of the opportunities that we have as the church is to help the world see an attitude that's different, a posture that stands in stark contrast to the rest of the world around us. And so what we could do today is literally take this passage and go full stop on just the first phrase. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we ought to thank God always. We could stop right there. We ought to thank God always because that's the passage, right? That's the phrase you can highlight or underline or bank on because that should be the posture of every believer. So number one today, we the church, right? We thank God always. Again, a little more context into what was happening here. In the first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote to them, and one of the themes that he spent time developing was this idea of the day of the Lord. One of the issues the early church wrestled with, we wrestle with to this day, right, is the second coming of Jesus. We know it's certain, we know it's going to happen, but when and how and what it's gonna look like and how will we be sure and all of those things and those same anxieties and fears in some ways gripped the early church. And so between the few months that these two letters were written, 1 Thessalonians and 2, there had been some false teachers who had come into the church and it had confused them leading the church at Thessalonica, some of them to believe that Jesus had already come. It had been like a secret spiritual coming and they had missed it. And so they were fearful and terrified and understandably so, right? Like, wait, I thought if I was in Christ, then I wouldn't miss his second coming. And Paul writes them to assure them. Verse two of chapter two, brothers and sisters, don't be easily upset or troubled. Verse three, don't let anyone deceive you. And he goes on to explain to them that there were some signs still to come. One of them, of course, was the great rebellion. The other one was the appearance of what he describes as the man of lawlessness. Scholars connect that in biblical literature, of course, to the person that we better known as the Antichrist. Or if you're a fan of the Left Behind series, Nikolai Carpathia, right? That was his name in those books. And so uh, the reality of Paul and what he's trying to teach them and to tell them is to say, listen, hang on, God's got this. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you haven't missed anything. And so yes, be urgent, be prepared, but know this, your posture can be to thank God always because you are secure in your salvation. And this posture of thanksgiving is a way of life well, that's consistent with so much of what scripture tells us. Psalms 92, one and two. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing your praises to your name most high. I love this. To declare your faithfulness in the morning and your faithfulness at night. That we can give thanks. Why? Because when we wake up in the morning, God's given us another day. We can lay our head in the pillow at night and say, thanks, Lord, you, you have been faithful today. Psalm 100, verse four, enter his gates with what church? Thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Psalm 107, one, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. 
And you begin to see how the New Testament authors picked up on that theme. Paul in Romans 14, 6, whoever observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord since he gives thanks to God. Did you realize like there's a biblical precedent for us saying thanks before a meal? That's where it comes from. Romans 14, 6. Colossians 3, 17. Whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, you do it all as you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in thanksgiving. I love the way that he puts that, right? Part of what keeps us alert is always having a heart of gratitude, giving thanks. And then, of course, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, the previous letter to the one we're looking at today. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Christ Jesus in you. So we, the church, live a lifestyle of gratitude by which we are always thanking God. Paul gets more specific, and this is our second point, right? We thank God for the gospel. We thank God that the gospel that he has authored has come to us. And so it says, we thank God always for you, brothers and sisters. And of course, we say that often, right, this time of year. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We love our family. But specifically, Paul says, we give thanks because you are loved by the Lord. Because get this, from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in truth. Two things at least there to hang your hat on, right? Paul wants to remind the church and he wants to remind us. Number one is God's power on display through his eternal plan and purposes. You see, sometimes when they're in the middle of a crisis, uncertainty, we need that long view lens. And Paul zooms out and he reminds the church at Thessalonica, the early church, that God, Isaiah 46.10, knows the end from the beginning. He reminds them, just like he did in Ephesians chapter 1, that they were chosen from the foundation of the world. That God had set the gospel into motion and that God had made a way for the gospel to come to them. And they had responded to that gospel. And so now, in the power of the Spirit, he was going to see them through to the end, no matter what they faced in the world. What an incredible truth for us and them to wrap our hearts and our minds around to give us comfort and peace in a time like this. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, where he reminded, where Peter reminds the early church of their identity. You are who? You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for his possession. Again, Paul's telling them, Peter's telling them, you belong to God. And if we affix worth to things in this world that have been owned by celebrities or famous people, as we talked about, well, then how much more does it matter that you belong to God? And from this sense of security and foundation, we begin to recognize that we can stand. Verse 15, so then brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught. I love what theologian John Stott says about standing firm. He says, let the devil mount his fiercest attack on the feeblest saint. Let the Antichrist be revealed and the rebellion break out. Yet over against the instability of our circumstances and our characters, we set the eternal stability of the purpose of God. Translation, Paul is telling them, even if all hell breaks loose on earth, you serve the one who has conquered death and hell. Amen? And in that gospel, we stand. So brothers and sisters, never, never get over what we have in the gospel, that a just and gracious creator of the universe, God, looked upon us, hopelessly sinful men and women. And instead of remaining far off, right, he chose, he had involved. He came in the person of Jesus, God in the flesh, who not only lived a sinless life, but he died a death on the cross to bear the wrath against the sin that we deserved. 
He showed his victory over sin and death and the resurrection as we sang about in Living Hope just a few moments ago so that we would know that every man, woman, boy, and girl who turns from their sin and themselves to a Savior in Jesus will be reconciled to God forever. Never get over what God has done for us in the gospel Give thanks to God for that every day. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. Paul says, this is who you are. And so you stand firm in this. You hold on to the traditions. What does he mean by the traditions? Well, the tendency, right, in the church, when we face something difficult, is to try to look for something new, something novel, something to breathe life back into the church. But the answer Paul is telling us to standing firm is not by finding something new, but by on focusing on something old and rich and true. And that's the scriptures. It's the same thing Jude is writing in verse three of his letter. We contend for the faith once and all delivered to the saints. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 that we looked at just a few weeks ago. It's where Paul reminds Timothy, you continue, keep walking in what you have learned and firmly believed. You see, there are 10,000 things that we could be thankful for, but none surpasses the indescribable gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. So we give thanks to God for the gospel. And then rooted in that, our third point this morning is this. We thank God for the strength for every good word and work. I love how pastoral Paul is. And really these two verses are a prayer where he says this. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement. These words, loved and has given us, those are in what's called the aorist tense in Greek. What that means is he's pointing back to God's plan of salvation, something that God did in the past that has and will continue to have impact in the present and in the future. In other words, anytime you need encouragement, our encouragement is not temporary, it is eternal. Every single sailor on a ship will tell you The only way they keep from getting seasick as they're tossed to and fro in the waves is by fixing their eyes on a fixed point on the horizon. It's the only way you can do it. And the same thing Paul is telling the Thessalonians, he would tell us. The only way you can navigate the choppy waters of the moment that you're in is to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as your eyes are fixed on him, it's going to help you to stand firm and hold fast in this moment. He says, in eternal encouragement and good hope by grace. I love this phrase, right? Good hope. Because most of the hope we talk about is pretty flimsy these days. As a matter of fact, it's been kind of funny for me to watch people say, man, I can't wait till we get done with 2020 as if we're gonna flip the calendar page and all this is gonna go away. If that's you, I'm sorry I just ruined your morning, okay? I'm sorry, right? But that's, that's what I call a flimsy hope, right? Something's gonna change just because, right, the clock ticks down to a new year, just because we turn a calendar page? No, we need hope that's more significant and deeper than that. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter five. He says, we rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope, and this hope will not disappoint us. This hope won't let us down. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's what I call good hope. And it's that hope in which we stand. And that hope then gives us the strength to not just right, glory in it ourselves. Certainly that's where we should begin, understanding this foundation that we have. But to Paul's point in this passage, for us who are in Christ Jesus, this strengthens us in every good work and word. And our thanksgiving overflows into our ministry. And our posture is that of telling people about the good news that we've found, the good news that has come to us in Jesus. 
So let's talk about some practical handles for this today, right? Because we, the church, as the church, we combat confusing times by uh, cultivating gratitude in a number of ways. Let me give you one this morning. Number one, make Thanksgiving a daily habit rather than just a yearly holiday. We need to make Thanksgiving a part of our everyday life rather than just something we think about one week or one day out of the year. Let me go ahead and use social media speak here, right? If you are only giving thanks one time a year, then you're not doing it right. That's the way the New Testament would put that for us in our modern moment. It's interesting because this week, LifeWay Research pushed out a survey of Americans in general, not just churchgoers or Christians, right? It said at Thanksgiving, to whom do you typically give thanks? And I know the print's really small there, so I'll read it off for you. But family, right, 68% of people say, I'm grateful for my family. I give thanks to my family, which might seem a little odd, right? 67%, about two thirds of Americans give thanks to God. Friends, 42%. Okay, this is where it gets really interesting to me. 16% of Americans say that they give thanks to themselves on Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, does anybody else find that odd? I've prepared this bountiful meal to thank myself for how awesome I am, right? I mean, it just feels really bizarre. And then right underneath that, 10% of Americans give thanks to fate, right? I want to thank fate for the fact that this turkey magically appeared on my table, right? I want to give thanks to fate for the year 2020. Like, if that's you, you've got a dark sense of humor, right? It's just funny. And I get it, right? This wasn't just church-going people that they surveyed. Yeah, we're grateful for family and friends and these kind of things. But obviously, what we're supposed to cultivate, right, and all that confusion about who to even give thanks to, right, we as believers are continually living a lifestyle of thanksgiving and gratitude. And in doing so, it recalibrates our hearts and our mind. Love what Elizabeth Elliot, wife of missionary Jim Elliot, what she wrote. She says, the mature Christian offers not just polite thanks, but heartfelt thanks that springs from a deeper source than just our own pleasure. Thanksgiving is a spiritual exercise necessary to the building of a healthy soul. It takes out of us the stuffiness of ourselves and it takes that into the fresh breeze and the sunlight of the will of God. The simple act of thanking him is for most of us an abrupt change of activity, a break from work and worry, a move towards recreation. Those are powerful words. She's reminding us, right, that it's soul work when we're thankful because most of us are going down constantly this rabbit trail, this hamster wheel, right, of more and more and worry and anxiety and stress and work. And when all of a sudden we stop to be grateful, it recalibrates our hearts and our minds. It recreates in us an orientation towards the God who loves us and gave his son for us. The second way we can combat confusing times by cultivating gratitude right now is when overwhelmed, stop and count your blessings. Do you remember the old hymn? When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it might surprise you what the Lord has done. Those are good words for this moment for us. It's good to take out your journal, pull out your phone, and to just begin lists, right? The reasons that you are grateful. And what's interesting is, I think Paul models something for us important here. Notice when confronting the confusion and uncertainty of the, of the Thessalonian church, he didn't start with saying, hey, you know, thank God for your food and your shelter and your clothes. Did Paul believe that God provided those things? Yes. But instead, Paul said, but remember first what you have in Christ. So start with your spiritual blessings, right? Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his spirit that lives in me. Thank you for the gospel that came to me. Thank you for the people who brought that gospel into my life. Thank you for your word. Again, we just begin with listing our spiritual blessings. Thank you for the riches that we have in Christ. Thank you that we can stand firm in a world full of shifting sand. On and on we can go. And then we need to give thanks what? For our relationships that God blessed us with. Thank you, Lord, 
for the fact that I can be reconciled to you so now I can be reconciled to others. Thank you for my parents and my spouse. Thank you for my spiritual support system. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my life group. Thank you for my community. And we can just go on and on, right? Counting those relationships that give life to us, that breathe life into us. And yes, there's a time and a place to thank God for the things that he has given you as well that provide for your basic needs and then for most of us in this room, way, way beyond. You can even thank God for your circumstances, no matter what they are. Today, this morning, I'm in a position of gratitude. I'll tell you why. With a couple of other dads in the neighborhood, we just took a weekend camping, father-son trip, and we went mountain biking. And Thursday morning, I found myself on top of a mountain north of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It's a place called Windrock. And I peered over the edge with the mountain bike I was on, and I realized I was about to die. So by the grace of God, I made it down that mountain, right? Because I had no business at 45 years old, hurtling down that mountain, chasing my 12-year-old son on a bike as he did it effortlessly, right? But here I stand, praise God, no broken bones. You can thank God for those things. Thank him and cultivate that sense that God is at work in your life and he has been good to us, better than we deserve. When overwhelmed, stop and count your blessings. And last but certainly not least, a third way we cultivate gratitude, right, is that we stand firm and we are strengthened by these truths. I love that Paul concludes this letter near the end with this verse in chapter three, verse 13. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. Oh, we're exhausted. We confess that. We're weak, we admit it. Again, we're confused, it's uncertain times, we're not sure when things are gonna get better, if they get better at all, we don't know. But here's the word, right? Don't grow weary in doing good. It's not you that's at work, but it's the spirit of the living God working and moving in and through you. And so to remind us of that today, this is the reason why we're going to take of the Lord's Supper. So I want you to find your elements that were handed to you on the way in. Because we're gonna conclude this series, We Are the Church, by celebrating what brings us together as the church. And that is the sacrifice of Jesus for us. It's what Jesus did for us that we never want to get over. So, a little practical word of instruction. If you're with us in the room, if you're at home, grab your bread. If you're in the room, take the cellophane and separate it from the foil and peel back that cellophane and take that piece of bread in your hands. Because I love how practical this is. That Jesus gave us a powerful symbol that we could touch and taste, that we could hold in our hands to be reminded that we have something tangible, something real to be grateful for. And it's what he's given us, the salvation that God had planned and the good news that has come to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're gonna do a responsive reading again that reminds us of why Jesus had to come, that leads us in a corporate confession of our sin. And so on the screen, it will say, leader, I'll read that part. People, that's your part. Let's read this together as we come to the table this morning. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, 
our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. I'll take that foil lid and peel it back. And after supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ had died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God. And we all say together, thanks be to God. Stand with us as we sing, O come to the altar.